Hello? Is this the NHS helpline? Yeah, hello, yeah, I'm well. I'm well, thanks. Um, but I'd like to get someone sectioned, and I don't really know what the process is. Right. Right. Y right. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, I, I don't know about that. Well, because I'm not with them physically. I, I, I don't know where they are. They're in Japan, I think. I'm not sure. I've never met them. I'm just calling on their behalf. Oh, well, you see, they directed Yakuza 0. What, what do you mean, what? Have you played it? Oh, well, that explains it. No, 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 no. Don't worry, it's fine. I don't blame you. It's not a particularly well-known franchise. It's all right. Have you got a few minutes? I'll be happy to explain it to you. You see, Yakuza 0 is a game Google describes as action-adventure, which tends to be a very nebulous term used to describe games that kind of defy genre, but I guess if they called it inexplicably attractive men with zero social awareness who get really uppity about not murdering people while also caving in heads with lead pipes left, right and centre simulator, it would mess up more than a few filing systems. Yakuza 0 is a really strange game, a prequel to, what, seven more really strange games, all developed by Sega? Or at least Zero was developed by Sega. I didn't didn't bother to check for the others. It focuses on Kiryu Kazuma and Goro Majima, two of the centermost characters of the Yakuza franchise in their former years. And I know this is a bit off topic, but I don't think a single person working at Sega has ever met a man in their early 20s. Am I honestly supposed to believe that Kiryu is 20 years old and that Majima is 24? Look at that bone structure. Look at that muscle definition. There's not a 20 year old in the world that looks like that. Anyway, anatomical discrepancies aside, I can assure you if this story was any cheesier, I would be able to scrape it off the sole of my foot in flakes. Look, I'm not going to delve too deeply into spoiler territory, but every narrative crumb of this game leaves me utterly bewildered. Every choice these characters make makes me want to take them by the shoulders and shake them until they stop opening their mouths when they shouldn't. All they do is scream and take off their shirts and hit people. If they weren't so lean, they'd be comparable to football fans. I mean, some of the characters are pretty interesting in this. The Dojima family lieutenants, for example, are all written and voiced extremely well, but so many of the cast are just dumb as shit with so few redeemable features that you could never possibly empathise with them? Let me give you an example. At one point, Majima kneels over a dying person. They've been shot in the chest, they're lying at his feet, and he just cries for a bit about how sorry he is, about how much he wished he could have liked and subscribed to this channel, hint hint. He doesn't try to staunch the bleeding, he doesn't call for help, he doesn't try and treat the wound in any way. Despite the fact that he took his shirt off only moments before to fight some goons, and clearly isn't using it for anything else, he doesn't doesn't try and use it to staunch the bleeding. At this point, he is pushed aside by a clearly far more capable person, who then has the victim rushed to hospital, and they survive, despite how much time was wasted for the sake of emotion. And I'm supposed to care about Majima after that? I'm supposed to relate to him? He's the biggest knobhead in the game, a judgement I made despite the fact I was surrounded by people assuring me that he gets better in later games. Yeah, I'm sure he does, but this is the first game I've played, I have no connection to him. I don't care if this was one missing step in his characterization. It's the only characterization I know. Speaking of Majima, the way the narrative treats women and LGBT plus people is insane. I know this game is set in the 1980s, but Christ, characters treat women and queer people like shit, which wouldn't be an issue if the game shone a light on it as negative. But you hear this like swell of stock anime piano music and you know that the game is trying to pass it off as positive. Like you see the soft light of the evening sun shining and the emotional tears running down Majima's face as he gently but firmly tells a woman to save herself for her husband, before he waddles back to his hostess club and continues to sell his hostess's time to rich men, encourage them to dress sexy, and trains them to be better dates while they obsessively fawn over him and all fall in love with him for some reason? I know that it's their job and they chose to do it, but you can't encourage sexuality only when you make a profit from it and demonise it when people are doing it of their own volition. There are only a couple of women in the main story and a handful of women in the side quests or sub-stories as the game calls them, and yes, I know it sounds like sub-stories, and damn, they are poorly written. Any woman who becomes empowered or self-confident is immediately killed or physically put in her place to be saved by the main characters, and all other women across the game are just doe-eyed and subservient. Unless they're ugly or masculine, and then they're made the butt of every single joke. One woman is even completely blind just for the sake of being a helpless damsel in distress. Some women are physically
physically or even sexually assaulted and then saved just to make the main characters look better, at which point they fall in love with their saviour, but are coolly and aloofly ignored because Kiryu and Majima are too awesome to bother with sex and boobs and stuff. If a woman is being sexual in a way that she's comfortable with, consents to and feels empowered by, the game has to find a way to justify Kiryu or Majima's insertion in the situation, usually by making these women the brunt of vicious attacks they need to be saved from, or making it so that these women are being controlled by cruel, shrew women who manipulate them and force them to use their sexuality for profit, but not in a way that Majima likes so it has to stop. They need to be reminded that they're disappointing their loved ones, that they're wasting themselves before they meet their husband, that they're ruining their lives, and then Kiryu goes to the telephone club and plows some broad on his own terms and apparently that's fine. They even have the gall to play Kiryu off as some naive virgin when he literally only spends extended time with women in the event that he can have sex with them. On the other side of the spectrum, an actual child, an actual eight or nine year old boy, asks Kiryu to fetch him a pornographic magazine from a vending machine, and Kiryu decides to do it. Kiryu agrees. Kiryu has to sneak around to avoid the gaze of patrolling judgmental women on the street, and only women, to grab a magazine from this vending machine, at which point he says to the boy, I wouldn't say no to this request because you're your own person, and I'd rather you got this from me, a man with no ill intent, than some creepy predator who would take advantage of you. Take this magazine home, hide it, and one day you'll understand what the pictures mean. No parental consent is required. Kiryu just straight up respects this child in a way he respects no female character across the entirety of the game, explains this adult concept to him carefully and gently, and then lets him off on his own way. Don't get me wrong, this is good! It just needs to be the same for both genders. The main characters of Yakuza 0 nurture masculinity. They teach the men around them to be strong and mature, to understand the world around them, to be responsible and kind and considerate to others. The women of Yakuza 0 are gently reminded to know their place while piano music plays in the background. I know that the setting was sexist, you know, the 1980s, but if they were sexist and the game pointed at their behaviour to highlight problems and show teaching points, I'd respect that. Instead, it's treated like normal and even positive that they completely disrespect the choices of women, and the narrative even punishes women for making their own choices. That's not even the end of it. As I learned when I googled the name of a woman who I was searching in the wrong arcade for, all of the female side characters in this game are named after adult softcore porn actresses. That was definitely a highlight of the browser history on my work laptop, oh my god, I'm sorry, IT support, I hope you didn't see it. After you complete a set of requirements, you can access their associated videos in the sexy video store. Sometimes you have to make friends with them, sometimes you have to bring them things, sometimes you have to complete unrelated tasks, but after enough effort you'll earn access to seeing all of them in their undies. Then we have the telephone club, whereby if, god forbid, Kiryu accidentally goes out to hook up with a woman he doesn't realise is <gasps> ugly, or a bit older than he thought she would be, Kiryu will still spend the night with her but will lose hell as though it has physically hurt him to have sex with her, even though he takes her to a hotel of his own volition? Like it has injured him to have had to bestow this woman with his penis. He walks away the following morning shaking his head, disappointed in himself for willingly consenting to a night with a woman who is well below his pay grade. And don't get me started on the JCC. Not for the sex factor, because of the RNG element. I spent two days playing glorified rock paper scissors with some slag in a bikini, only for her to get second wind, hop up, and instantly kill me with no chance for me to respond. It's a bit weird, but honestly this was the most forgivable part of the game in terms of female representation for me. The girls in the JCC are dressed in sexy outfits, they're sexy nurses, sexy receptionists, sexy swimwear models, but the game doesn't pretend like they're teaching any lessons. It doesn't pretend like they're part of some moral campaign. It's just some hot women doing some sexy fighting, and I can respect that. It's the only part of the game that's honest in the fact that it's just showing some fine ladies in some nice costumes, and that is fine by me. This minigame actually got a free pass from me here. Uh, too bad the actual gameplay of the minigame was terrible, but we'll get onto that later. But honestly, the worst portrayal in this game is of transgender people. As a cisgendered person, I don't feel super qualified to drill into this problem as much as I'd love to, so I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of some of the key problems I noticed and you can make your own judgments. The main victim of transphobia in this game is the Pleasure King, a trans woman described by characters as the spirit of a woman in a man's body, whose physical appearance and mannerisms are played for laughs and exaggerated to the point of making her out to be a sexual predator. There's also the bartender of Earth Angel, whose gender identity is not disclosed so I won't assume, but there being a man dressing in makeup and dresses is also played for laughs over and over again. Their unique character model being made to look very ugly in comparison to every other character model in the game, which was a clearly intentional step to make a joke out of their physical appearance just so Kiryu can act shocked and repulsed when
when he meets them, and so he can rush off screen whenever they try and speak to him. And of course, they're not real women, so you're allowed to physically beat them up as well. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting emotional, which is a perfect segue, because this game plays so intensely with emotion that I'm pretty sure I spent most of the narrative in the fetal position, just cringing my soul straight out of my body. So many times, characters would be gritting their teeth as though they're about to explode, screaming their enemies' names in the super anime way. Any time you saw a high-definition cutscene start, to the point where characters' pores were visible on their faces, you knew you were in for a good old anime scream. God, I hate it. I hate it. I, I cannot deal with it. I was lucky enough to have Sega's verified Twitch account come into the stream at one point to say hello and ask us how we were all enjoying the game. And I had to pretend that I was loving life, when in reality I'd had it so much by that point that I was on the verge of calling it a night. And then there'd just be some random quick time event for Kiryu to wipe his bum or something, and if you fail it in the two seconds you're allotted, because you will definitely fail it the first time round, because you'll probably have stopped to take a drink or pop to the kitchen, and you lose, Kiryu will end up having to fight somebody to the death or something, or you'll miss out on one of the many missable trophies dotted throughout the story that, even though I had a literal list of them next to me as I played, I always failed to recognise were coming up, so I ended up having to redo a bunch of them on my legendary playthrough. The QTEs in this game are a nightmare, and there's one particularly famous one that you'll basically just have to take as a loss because there's no way you'll manage it, given that you have less than a second to respond when it pops up. On that note, the fighting stances in this game are really difficult to appreciate. By the time I'd finished my 150 hour stint with this title, I was well acquainted with each and even liked some, but the game starts you with Kiryu's brawler stance, which is possibly one of the stiffest, simplest fighting stances I've ever tried. It took me a good few hours before I properly got to grips with it, by which point I'd unlocked the far more fun rush and beast stances, which were actually great fun to use and made the game a pleasure to play on both easy and legendary difficulty. The same for Majima too, who starts with Thug Stance, functionally very similar to Kiryu's Brawler, and learns Breaker, a fighting stance based on breakdancing, and Slugger, a fighting style that uses a whacking great metal bat. And honestly, with those at your disposal, why would you ever bother to go back to Thug? That's like letting you move back to your dingy studio apartment after giving you Wayne Manor for free. You're just not gonna bother. Besides when combing through the completion list or using stances when forced to, I never use those starter styles again. You can speed them up with upgrades and items, but usually you'll have written them off by then. Also, Kiryu's brawler stance can be upgraded so that he does extra damage when drunk, so like my dad, you'll be punting between pints like nobody's business. Honestly, I remember very little of the main game, because I got the platinum trophy for this one, a grind that took approximately 150 hours, with some of the weirdest requirements for a game I'd ever seen. You see, for the Yakuza 0 Platinum, you need to 100% your completion checklist. What kinds of things does that entail? I hear you ask. No worries, straw man, I'll answer that for you. The short answer is, just normal video game stuff. The long answer is, running a hostess club for the better part of 20 hours, a mini game I initially adored, but ended up absolutely hating by the end of it. Dine at all the eateries on the maps, earn a total of 50 billion yen, collect 30 telephone cards of half-naked women, watch 30 softcore video clips, defeat 200 enemies in all 8 fighting stances, spend 10 hours waiting for your money bar to rise during the real estate minigame, buy every available property across every map, raise all those properties to rank S, recruit all possible real estate employees, recruit all possible hostesses, partner with every available shop, buy every available outfit and accessory for your top hostesses, complete every disc dance on every available difficulty, complete all 100 sub-stories, chat up all the available chat upable women on the phone, collect all the random components for some little pocket circuit car, win all the races in said pocket circuit car, win a total of 100 million yen by betting on cat fights, get a certain number of points on all the available arcade games, acquire every available prize from the claw machine, win a certain amount of money from every gambling game, complete a specified number of random trick shots in darts, bowling, shogi, mahjong and pool, catch all the different fish, fresh water and salt water of course, and get a certain number of points in all karaoke songs just to name a few broad examples. I mean, it's not necessarily a bad endeavour. The disco was my favourite of all the mini games, closely followed by karaoke. The fight stance training sessions were all really fun, and once you had an understanding of fishing, it could go pretty well. The arcade games were great too, except for Fantasy Zone, which was a nightmare that I at least came to respect, and many of the stance requirements could overlap with other requirements, such as beating shakedowns, welling coliseum battles, 
and finishing sub-stories. Most of the stuff on the completion list can be grindy, but is overall pretty fun. Most of it. You see, some of the list items thus yet are mentioned introduce two very unwelcome aspects to the completion checklist. RNG and grind. RNG became a huge source of frustration playing through the game. The JCC, the Japanese Cat Fighting Club, will probably lure you in with the promise of women doing some sexy fighting, only to immediately repulse you when you realise it's a glorified game of rock, paper, scissors, with a button mashing element that only barely serves to aid in your victory. Much akin to the delicate art of making a woman come, you can smash the button as much as you want, but unless the god of RNG shines upon you, you won't win. I have. Come. Most victories come down purely to random chance and you need to win a tournament, a set of three individual fights, to cash out in the green. Again, much like making a woman come. It takes a long time in my case, maybe two days of brain dead grind. Believe me, when you're looking at a cutscene of a scantily clad woman being strangled by the thighs of another scantily clad woman, and actually deciding to skip through it because you're so bored, you'll know that mankind has taken one solemn step backwards. The gambling was also a victim of RNG-based gameplay, which is a much more forgivable thing, considering it's basically RNG in real life, but the problem here was that you had to win a huge amount of money from this very unsteady, unreliable method. Blackjack was, in my experience, the worst offender of this. You see, with Blackjack, you need to earn 5 million yen total. However, this was a net amount, not gross. So if you entered 5 games in a row and, despite winning a few, lost more than you won, this number would not increase. Therefore you had to enter a game, win it, and exit the game to cash out and bank those winnings. The maximum you could win in a single game was 100,000 yen, which meant that you had to win 50 games of blackjack to reach this completion requirement. On the basis that you'll probably lose just as many games as you win, and maybe draw on a few more than that, you'll have to play well over 100 games of blackjack to hit this number, a feat that took me a good few sessions of non-stop play. It was such a repetitive feat that a PC player could easily make a script to have their character do it over and over again, while they go elsewhere and do something much more fun like bragging about their graphics card on a console subreddit or harassing Fortnite fans. I'm on PS4 though, so I have to harass people in my own time. I don't mind having a few RNG based requirements on the completion list, but this game asks you to absolutely own RNG based games for several hours, which becomes a very tedious task very quickly. When all success comes down purely to random luck, there's zero growth and zero personal development from grinding for it. Just some kind of twisted tenacity, which actually sounds like it would be a great band name, so please write that down. In fact, everything this game introduces you to, it expects you to crush over and over again. Why play something you enjoy once when you can play it 10 times, 100 times, 500 times, the completion list of Yakuza 0 asks that you take mini games you enjoy and play them until you absolutely hate them, and then play them some more. And this is where the grind comes in. Some aspects of the completion list are particular offenders, such as the Colosseum, which asks that you reach rank B to unlock the Endless Route, a mini game which is actually really easy by itself, and complete a number of Colosseum fires. I think the final number is 100, it might be 50. This takes ages. Every time you beat a Colosseum fight to increment the rank progress bar, i.e. the experience required to hit the next rank. Once you're at rank D, that bar becomes insanely hard to fill, and it will take you what feels like hours of fighting the same fight over and over again before you hit rank B. In my case, I picked a weird match with some clown man who I zapped once with the zap gun and watched him ragdoll limply on the floor in front of me and did that maybe like 30 times, maybe 50, 60, I, I, I don't remember anymore. It was also the very final thing I did, so I hated it all the more. Another aspect of this grind was the weapon shop, a location used by Majima to send out agents to scour different locations for weapons, items and crafting materials. You need to collect an enormous amount of these for the completion list. I was probably sat at my desk doing it in different spurts for a grand total of 20 hours, just sending out agents exiting the dialogue, waiting a few seconds, checking on the agents, seeing if I collected anything new, realising I hadn't, and sending them out again. You can collect items that promise you rare or finds, but these actually lower the occurrence rates of other items and materials, so it doesn't save you that much time or money in the long run. You also can't ask the agents to pick up specific items, just rely on their random chance of collection. So if you're looking for an atomic butt plug and he keeps bringing you a nuclear dildo, you just have to grit your teeth and watch the numbers stack. Sometimes they didn't bring anything back. Imagine a member of 
of the mafia giving you 200 million yen and telling you to go and grab anything from a local ruin, and you have the gall to come back and shrug your shoulders? The bollocks on some of those agents, I swear. Why don't you just steal my house keys so you can go and fuck my wife? Oh no, wait, she got tragically shot when she stood up to some street thugs. It was a really poignant moment, actually. It really added to my own personal character arc. What was, what was her name? What was her name again? What was my wife's name? Ah, I don't remember. Plus, the amount of attention this minigame required from you meant that you couldn't just walk away and do something else in real life while waiting for the agents to return. You had to be constantly present. It was mental. And I don't want to exaggerate here, but I would rather have a hose threaded through me from mouth to anus and my cold corpse displayed as a creepy water fountain in someone's weird garden than have to do the proving grounds again. I am serious. Well, I'm, I'm not that serious. I've never been stalked, but just in case someone that weird is hearing this, please don't actually kidnap me and turn me into a garden ornament. Anyway, the Proving Grounds are part of a bunch of challenges you can undertake outside of the main game called Climax Battles. Each one has a set character of the two, Majima or Kiryu, and they will be either weak with no upgrades to any of their abilities, or strong with fully upgraded abilities. Most of them are easy, or at least simple. You have a time limit or a set task, and a single health bar, and you need to fight a set number of enemies under those conditions. More often than not, you need to fight one or multiple Mr. Shakedowns, a boss rush, or just several waves of enemies. Most of these can be achieved without issue, even levels that need you to complete them without being hit a single time. However, Proving Grounds 5, 8, 9, and Ultimo Battle 1 really tested my capacity to follow through with this game to completion, particularly 8, which asks you to condense a 10 minute fight into a time limit of only a few minutes. 8 and 9 came down to almost RNG, whether enemies were near me at the right time, whether I got staggered or not by a a certain attack, whether enemies were aggressive or not, or if they were passive and stayed in the background. I paid a friend in Five Guys to do number 8 for me via share play, and I care not. Although we both realised much later that we'd been doing Majima's spin to win attack wrong and triggering it too early, therefore having him do it in the much flimsier handstand stance rather than spinning close to the ground and being basically invulnerable to attacks. So it potentially could have been easier, but probably not by much. My opinion of the game was so bad by the end of the completion list that I was ready to write it off. Just an arrogant, smug, time-wasting experience for people who love shallow soap operas and having their days wasted. I was angry that everything the game asked me to do, it arbitrarily demanded I do another a thousand times just for the sake of completion, even when I learned nothing and gained nothing from doing it. I don't really object to lengthy platinums, but I feel like I need to be learning, developing skills, overcoming challenge, not just needlessly tapping the same buttons over and over again, bored out of my mind. I was furious, even bitter, that a game had so thoroughly wasted of my time that I went into the legendary playthrough with the aim to have it finished within 12 hours. And I had so much fun! The legendary playthrough of this game scurried through at hyperspeed, dragged me back from the abyss and restored some faith in the game for me. Even made me remember it fondly. You see, the legendary playthrough is not an easy time. It is a stressful time, wherein your character can be finished in only a few hits, with no checkpoints, so death means restoring from a previous manual save. This created a nail-biting tension, wherein I pelted through the story as fast as I could, investing what little money I earned in the beast and breaker skill trees respectively until chapter 7, at which point I save scummed the weapon shop for a zap gun. A zap gun I then had my characters stuff their pockets with because it made bosses drop faster than your mum's knickers. With a sack full of zap guns and resurrection stones, the game fell to pieces before me. Besides one particularly gruelling chapter involving a car chase and a chainsaw, which saw my only death of the playthrough, the game was nailed in only two streams, one awesome weekend, and I finished the game with a smile on my face. Sometimes I even miss it. If it wasn't for the lingering memory of literally every other part of the game, I would go back to it. I try and platinum the game again on a different region store. I ate shit for dinner, but the dessert was a delicious chocolate fudge that made me forget all of my problems, and I look back favourably on that meal. I don't know if I'd recommend it. Shit, after all, can be an acquired taste, but I'd certainly tell potential customers that there's a nice chocolate cake waiting for you once it's all over. So does that explain things? What do you mean you can't section someone for that? Oh, I see, okay. You mean you're so cruelly underfunded after years of cuts by the Conservative government that you're completely crippled as an organisation? That sections of the National Health Service are being carved up and sold to the highest bidder? That if we're not careful, the United Kingdom could be forced into health insurance systems similar to the one currently responsible for millions of deaths and ruined lives over in the United States? Oh, alright, okay. So you're saying that everything I've told you, after everything you've heard, that it's just not justification for a sectioning, that it doesn't fall under the Mental Health Act? Uh-huh. Sure, right. Okay, well, you clearly don't know anything about games. 
Anyway, thanks so much for watching my review until the end. If you enjoyed it, please like the video and subscribe to my channel for more. A big thanks, as always, to my patrons and my editor, Shekel Maester. And as always, thank you for watching. La 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 la,